how will you be remembered? You will be remembered, you know. Choices we make day to day, moment by moment, year to year, just frame a lifetime and can be impactful for good, for God, or less than that. And that's the challenge of living our life for Him. We'll talk about that today. Pastor Mark Hensley here from the Pikes Peak Park Baptist Church in beautiful Colorado Springs. I hope you're doing well. Wherever you're from, let us know how we can pray for you and where you're watching from. And do share this with your friends. That's how we partner together in spreading God's good news. Let's pray. Father, thank you that each day we have choices that if led by your spirit can be so impactful beyond our own lifetimes. Remind us that life is fleeting and moments of opportunity pass quickly. Remind us too that uh, night is coming when no man or woman will work. Help us to make the most of our days. And we do pray for this country. We pray for political leaders, military leaders, police around the country. We pray for citizens. We pray that we would become more and more united as a country. We pray for the end to the Ukrainian conflict. We pray for new beginnings um, for our own personal lives as we focus on you. And we just ask that you'd guide this time we have today in your word. We're, we're grateful for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So we will be remembered, and I think about that uh, often, about legacy and how we'll be remembered. And I know time just marches on. It's a constant change that we experience. Life goes so fast. It marches on with such a continued uh, predictability in some ways. Each day starts with the sunrise, ends with the sunset. And sometimes we can feel like we're kind of in an instant replay. I think about that sometimes. I'm thinking about that this summer. And some writer once really described the passing of summer, I thought, in such an eloquent way. The writer said this, Summer days are fading and melting like ice cubes in a glass of tea. It's not just summer days. It's fall days and winter days and spring days. I think about that. Wasn't it just yesterday that I was a kid playing in this city, actually in this very zip code? Wasn't it just yesterday that I was enjoying sumptuous meals as my mother prepared them for our family? And now there are two seats that are unoccupied. My father stepping into heaven in 1980, my beautiful sister Michelle stepping into heaven in the fall of 2009. Wasn't it just yesterday that I looked into the bluest eyes I can recall and promised to love, honor, and cherish her, and she did the same. Wasn't it just yesterday that I saw my bride on the arm of her father walking down a long aisle at Circle Drive Baptist Church? No. <laughs> It was 41 years ago now. Life marches on. And when you're young, it's interesting. It seems like time moves slowly. But when you get older, it just moves so rapidly. Think about it. I want you to think about time in a way maybe you've not thought about it before. If you had a bank account and every morning... As you woke up, you woke up and there was $86,400 in your bank account. What would you do? Well, you might pass out. But if that happened every day and you could spend $86,400 every day, you would make a con uh, concentrated effort to, I believe, knowing the people who are watching, to be benevolent, to be giving, to help people. And then what? would happen if every night at midnight, at the stroke of midnight, that account would go to zero. Well, you'd learn to be on mission, moment by moment, day by day. Every morning, you'd think, who can I bless on this day, these next 24 hours? Well, folks, listen, when we get up in the morning, God has given us 86,400 seconds in a 24-hour day to spend to make an impact, to be on mission for God, 
to be under the authority and directions and directives of the Holy Spirit? How are you spending your time as a believer? Today, we continue a series in the book of 2 Timothy. The Apostle Paul, as you know, is in a prison in Rome. It's really more like a dungeon. His execution is imminent. He is writing to a young man pastoring in Ephesus by the name of Timothy, a young man in his, probably in his 40s, and he wants to convey to him the things that matter most before his life concludes on this planet. And what he has to say to him helps us 2,000 years later how to prioritize and maximize our 86,400 seconds per day. The title of the message today from 2 Timothy chapter 2, 14 through 19 is an, an approved worker. You're looking at the pulpit that uh, was the pulpit of R.G. Lee, who pastored the Bellevue Baptist Church from 1927 to 1960, succeeded by Tennessee pastor Ramsey Pollard, who pastored from 1960 to 1972, succeeded by my mentor and favorite preacher, Adrian Rogers, who stepped into that pulpit in the uh, summer months leading into fall of 1972, and he occupied that pulpit for 32 years. Every one of those stalwart, godly pastors stood behind that sacred desk and week by week, year by year, decade by decade, pro proclaimed the word of God with distinction and integrity to the people of Memphis, Tennessee. And they remind me of what an approved worker looks like. So under that title, an approved worker, 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning of verse 14, remind them of these things and charge them before God, not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth, but avoid irreverent babble for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness and their talk will spread like gangrene among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus who have swerved from the truth saying that the resurrection has already happened they are upsetting the faith of some but God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal the Lord knows those who are his and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from Iniquity. Second Timothy chapter 2, 14 through 19, an approved worker must guard their speech. Don't major on the minors. Make sure that your speech is seasoned with salt. That's why the Bible says in the Old Testament that a word aptly spoken is like an apple of gold in a setting of silver. Weigh what you say. Before you say it, an approved worker guards their speech. Do you notice something else? An approved worker guards their doctrine. When you hear the word doctrine, think of it as a body of teaching. There are absolutes in the word of God, the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, the resurrection, the ascension, the second coming. All those things are critical. They're tenets that we don't tamper with. It's the word of God. And then an approved worker not only guards their speech, guards their doctrine, but they guard their conduct. There are expectations of how we live if we say we love the Lord. Live for him your whole life. Do you notice, first of all, an approved worker must guard their speech. Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Here's the Apostle Paul saying to Timothy, as you pastor in Ephesus, which is not the most enviable assignment in the Mediterranean, you're on the Aegean Sea, you're in a town of 250, 300,000 people, you have the Temple of Diana there, temple prostitution is in full strength, there are idol worshipers everywhere, you are dealing with people who are transients, people who are uh, natives, people who are sailors. There's ports. It's a port city. It's not going to be easy, Timothy. So when you think about serving God, you must also think about how you will serve God. The emphasis here is really, Timothy, make sure 
that your life is surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. We all have a choice of what we'll do and how we'll respond to the pressures and challenges of life. Paul wants Timothy to understand something. Before you ever teach, before you ever preach, before you ever try to affect change in a community, it better be real to you. And you need to guard your speech. Be careful. Um, sometimes in a, in a moment of anger, we can uh, lose our testimony. In, a, a, in an unprotected moment of temptation, we can ruin our lives. Determine how will I react before that opportunity to not act appropriately comes. It's a challenge for all of us. And it's interesting how speech is sometimes thought of in America. Most people uh, unwisely think that women speak more than men. But an article in the magazine Science blasts the popular myth that women are more talkative, talkative than men. You say, Pastor, tell me about it. Okay. Researchers outfitted 396 college students with devices that automatically recorded every word they spoke every 12 and a half minutes for an entire day. You say, that's interesting. I know. The researchers found that women speak a little more than 16,000 words a day. You say, well, that's what I thought. Men speak a little less than 16,000 words, but listen, the difference is not statistically significant. Psychologist Matthias Meal of the University of Arizona said that the three top talkers in the study speaking, uttering up to 47,000 words a day were all men. Verbal expressions are a part of our lives. Paul is warning us, warning Timothy to make your words count. Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good but only ruins the hearers. You'd be interested to know that the word quarrel here is understood as the word wrangle. Now, that's a Western term if you've ever heard it. It belongs in the uh, rodeo arena or out on the range somewhere. If you wrangle a steer or you wrangle a wild animal, you're going to use a rope and you're going to secure it that way. To wrangle is to take captive, really, of an animal, to wrangle them. Paul says to Timothy, don't forget to tell the people under your charge to not wrangle with their speech, not captivate or capture people with, with constant haranguing speech that uh, distresses them. Let your words, the Bible says, your conversation be seasoned with salt. That's not just lifestyle, but the way you speak the words of course in question are representing doctrinal viewpoints and some things it just doesn't matter thomas jefferson one of our great presidents brilliant president once said in matters of principle stand like a rock matters of taste swim with the current sometimes things aren't worth quarreling about now there are some doctrines like i said earlier that are not in my opinion up for debate the word of God is true. It's infallible. It's inerrant. You can count on it. The Lord keeps his promises. The Lord is coming again. The only way to heaven is through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ applied to us personally. Everyone needs to repent of sin and turn to Christ to be saved. Heaven is only going to be inhabited by those who have come under the, the authority of the Holy Scripture and the Holy God of, of uh, Jacob and, and Abraham and Isaac and have uh, committed their life to the Lord Jesus Christ, being convicted by the Holy Spirit. Those are factual, biblical truths that aren't open for debate, but there are some things that might be minute. It might be a, a position of taste. And so be careful with your words. These words themselves are all right, but what wrong is fighting over it and being destructive verbally. 
One pastor said false teachers do little more than quibble over terminology. They indulge in pseudo-intellectual theorizing rather than in productive study and a submission to God's word. One of these days, somebody's going to pick up this book and do what it says. That should be our goal. If you're going to be an approved worker, Timothy, and navigate through the choppy changes and pressures and temptations of Ephesus, you better guard your speech, teach others to do the same. But notice something else about the text. You have to guard your doctrine. Here's what Paul says to Timothy. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth, avoid irreverent babble. For it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them, Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. The pressure, which is a good pressure, from God's Holy Spirit is for those who stand behind a pulpit in front of God's people week by week, take very seriously the charge upon their lives. The half-brother of our Lord in the book of James will say, not many should be desiring to be teachers because you'll be held to a stricter standard. I feel the weight of that, quite honestly, to never ever misspeak or uh, somehow misconstrue uh, the word of God. And I pray that you'd pray for me, that I'll always be faithful to declare the wonderful works of God with integrity and someone who's forthright. Paul wants Timothy to understand, you've got to look in the mirror, kid. You've got to make sure that when you speak before God's people that you've done your homework. Don't mail it in. Don't, res don't uh, rest in your past ability. Don't um, fail to... Work hard at what you do. In fact, I'm thinking of something that happened to Laura and I probably around 1984. We were in seminary in Fort Worth. We had just gotten there. It was August 1984. So do the math. That's um, a lot of years ago. And um, we were trying to find a church. So we're visiting different churches in the Metroplex. And there's, do you know, there's over... Um, 300 Southern Baptist churches just in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. We're talking Southern Baptist churches. So we had a lot of churches to check out. I'll never forget being with her on a Sunday night and um, knowing that the pastor that was about to preach was educated at Southwestern Seminary, had a Master of Divinity degree, and we, in anticipation of a good message on a Sunday night, waited, and he got up to preach, and I'm telling you exactly what he said. The sermon's long forgotten, but the opening line I will never forget and he uh, said this, bless God, I don't know what I'm going to preach on tonight, but it's going to be good. Meaning he hadn't prepared, he hadn't studied, he wasn't a workman who was about to rightly teach and really handle the word or the sword of the spirit with grace and dignity and integrity. And he began to just chase rabbits for 20 or 30, 40 minutes. And we left there and we never went back. How audacious to step in front of the people of God who've come from a hard week of work, who need to hear from God. And that's what they have to hear. Years ago, there was a great preacher in New York City, brilliant Scottish preacher. And he was um, known for being a great preacher. And someone asked him about his preaching and and I loved what he said about that. He said, people come to hear you preach, Dr. McCracken. I thought I had the exact quote in my Bible. I don't, so I'm going to have to trust and lean into my own memory. Dr. McCracken, people come to hear you preach week by week. What do you think of that? What do they want to hear? And he said, he said, they come to hear something that's beyond themselves. And I pray that that's the expectation that God's people have whenever they come to any church and hold that pastor accountable to rightly divide the word of truth and to be an approvedman who needed a workman who needeth not be ashamed. It's a sacred trust, folks. When Dr. Rogers came to that pulpit you saw a picture of it a moment ago, 
in around August, September 1972 in Memphis, he came from the First Baptist Church of Merritt Island, Florida. He'd pastored there for eight years. And he stood in that pulpit, and I'm going to quote to you what he said to that Memphis congregation with 32 years of ministry about to begin in that place, in a worldwide ministry. This is what he said. I'm not the best preacher in the world. Many people can preach better than me. But they can't preach a better gospel than me because there's only one. And if I preach the Bible and God's word in this place, God will bless it. And he did. Tens of thousands of people saved. Millions around the world, really. And a ministry that continues even after his death on November 15, 2005. Why? Because he studied to show himself approved, a workman, a worker who need not be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. When you re read that phrase, rightly handling the word of truth, I want you to think of it as a sword that is in the hand of a warrior who's trained and they know exactly how to defend themselves and conquer the enemy. When you read the word, rightly handling the word of truth, I want you to think of someone who has prepared a, a wonderful meal and they make sure that everything is provided. They lay out a beautiful table full of delicious food like my mom did back in the day. Can you tell? I haven't had lunch today. The point is, is you're careful about handling God's word because it has eternal consequences. I feel the weight of that. And Paul wants Timothy to feel the weight of that study to show yourself approved, know what you're going to say, and ask the Holy Spirit to give flight to your words and to your intention, rightly handling. Paul names here in the text, you see it, false teachers who had so obliterated the plain teaching of Scripture that it left some people shocked and hurt, he references them, Philetus, Hymenaeus, and Philetus. And you can see what they've done in the text. They had said that the resurrection had already taken place. They must have utilized irreverent babble, leading people into ungodliness. Their talk had spread like a disease, like gangrene. They swerved, he said, from the truth. That's a frightening thought that someone can take a text and divert away from it and not even tell you what it's plainly teaching. Saying the resurrection had already happened. What they were saying is that the resurrection for the people who were following Jesus had already happened, so you have no hope. It's past tense. It's too bad for you. You're going to die and uh, there will be no resurrection. And that was a false Statement, nothing to look forward to, according to these men. They were upsetting the faith of some. To me, that's a very powerful statement. Of some, not all. Why? Because some were not well-versed in the doctrines of God. Some were not taking the time to go deep into understanding the doctrines of the Word of God. Now remember, when this is being written... The church is in its infancy. So the people then would have had to rely a lot on oral tradition, the testimonies of the great apostles of the faith, like Peter and Paul and, and some of the others. They had, to, they had to take handwritten copies of the scripture. It was still in inf its infancy and study it and understand it. But a lot of what we take for granted, having all 66 books bound in leather, the 39 of the Old Testament, the 27 of the New, they didn't have it. So they had to rely on really good teaching and then inbibbing it and memorizing it and considering it and contemplating it and relying on the Holy Spirit of God to instruct them. That's what we need. We need people. Why were only some confused by these two? false teachers, because they weren't prepared. And you and I have to be prepared. We live in perilous times. We don't know how long we'll have access to God's word. Hide it in your heart so we may not sin against thee, O God. Be sure to know what the word 
says. Christians become less and less familiar with Scripture. They'll find themselves susceptible to false doctrine on a regular basis. They become easy prey for jargon that sounds Christian but strongly mitigates against God's truth. Guard your speech. Guard your doctrine. And finally, do you notice in the text, guard your conduct. But God's firm foundation stands. Bearing this seal, the Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. David Gudzik, who's a wonderful pastor in California and a great commentator on the scripture, was commenting on this passage. I love what he had to say. He said, the Lord knows those who are his. He said, that's the first inscription on the seal that uh, he's referencing. If Hymenaeus and Philetus continue their destructive ministry, the Lord knows those who are his. If profane and vain babbling sweep the church like a cancer, the Lord knows those who are his. If the faith of some is overthrown, the Lord knows those who are his. Now, we don't always know those who are his. We can know for ourselves, for the scripture teaches that in Romans chapter 8, verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, but with others we can't always know those who are his. But listen to this, God doesn't sit on his throne in heaven wondering whether or not you're saved or not. He knows. God knows. God doesn't hope or wonder if you're going to make it to the end. God knows. The Lord knows those who are his. Do you notice the second inscription on the seal Paul references? Let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Some people say this. Well, I belong to the Lord. It doesn't really matter how I live. I'm free. You're not free to live any way you think you should. You are free to live a life that honors God and reveres his word and, and, and demonstrates a desire to do what he wants you to do, to live a righteous life. Sometimes righteousness intimidates but us, us, but if you take righteousness to its root word, it means a desire to do what is right. Folks, Christians don't steal. Christians won't steal on their taxes. Christians won't pat a time clock. Christians won't be unkind to their neighbor. Christians just live a life that honors the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean they don't mess up because we are far from perfect. But the Holy Spirit of God convicts us and he has given us an internal compass called the Holy Spirit and a conscience. And that's one of the great proofs of the validity of God is why is there in every human being a sense of right and wrong? It's because we were created. We didn't just crawl out of some primordial ooze somewhere and all of a sudden sprout wings and then legs and so forth. We are created by God. But when we're saved, there's a transformation that takes place. It's an ongoing metamorphosis, but we shouldn't be allured or drawn to the things we know God's word contradicts. If someone does not have the desire, listen to me, or the actions to depart from iniquity, and if you wonder what iniquity means, it means anything that's sinful, willfully, stands in contrast to the revealed word of God. Cheating, taking advantage of someone, just go through the Ten Commandments. Being unfaithful to your spouse, breaking a promise, being unkind to kids. The Bible says, do not exasperate your children, but raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I'm not telling you that we can live perfect lives, but I'm telling you that if we are filled with the Holy Spirit of God, we will live productive lives that honor God, and we won't be lawbreakers. God will change us and conform us into the image of his Son. I think of something I read years ago. A man, uh, when he was younger, stole uh, someone's beautiful gold pocket watch. It was just beautiful. And the man who lost it, had it stolen, was just beside himself. And years went by. But on a day, that thief gave his life to Jesus, asked Jesus to forgive him of his sins. And God keeps his word. Anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And the Holy Spirit came in and started to do a, a cleanup in that man's life and prompted him to remember how he had stole that gold watch and he took that watch 
The next day, to that man, he said, I want you to know something. I stole your pocket watch years ago, but I've given my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and I want you to forgive me. And I love what he said. He said, in fact, I tried to come by last night, but you weren't home. So I came the first moment I could. That's what God does in a human life. We can't right every wrong, but we'll have a desire to please God. I often think about how we should be when it comes to relationships with people from every walk of life. And I love what Paul said to Timothy early in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1. Listen to this. If we will do this, if all of our relationships will harmonize with what I'm about to read to you, we will have no more problems with other people. Now, they might get agitated for no real reason, but it won't because of our conduct. Listen to this and memorize this. 1 Timothy 5, verse 1. Never speak harshly to an older man, but appeal to him respect, respectfully as you would to your own father. Talk to younger men as you would to your own brothers. Treat Older women as if they were your mothers and treat younger women as if they were your sisters in all purity. We do that. We don't make headlines. We're not the subject of talk shows. We're not streamed on Facebook and mocked by a world who expects Christians to have high standards even if they don't hold to themselves. Recently, a well-known mega pastor from Texas had to be confronted for an interaction with a woman that, according to the elders of that church, wasn't sexual, wasn't specifically improper, but improper enough that he violated the principles of media at that church, and he has been suspended, may or may not return to the pulpit in that church. Guard your speech. Be careful with your tone. I often think, as I teach for Liberty University, when I reply to a student, I always think, what if this was put up on a jumbotron somewhere in a stadium? That's the same way when you are texted by someone, maybe of the opposite sex. Reply according to 1 Timothy 5, 1. Treat every older woman like it was your mother, every younger woman, like it was your sister in all Purity. We're talking about an approved worker who guards their speech, guards their doctrine, and guards their conduct. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? The starting point, the foundational place to begin for a life that will be remembered is to come boldly to the throne of grace in time of need, to humble yourselves, therefore, into the mighty hand of God, that in due time he may exalt you to cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you, to turn from sin and turn to Jesus and ask him to take over the totality of your life and to make your life count on your brief sojourn across the world stage so that people will remember that it was one person that really loved Jesus. What else matters, folks, than to live a life as an approved workman? Father, thank you for your word. If someone's watching who's not saved, let them turn to Jesus. Ask him to change their life, forgive them of their sin, come into their life, write their names in the Lamb's Book of Life, claim them as his own, invite them to be part of a forever family, and then to live for him to their last breath on this planet, to point everyone they can to what he can do in a human life. That would be such a wonderful thing for anyone watching today. And I thank you for changing my own life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We praise you and thank you that we have the opportunity with our 86,400 seconds a day to be approved workers who need not be ashamed. May that be said of us someday, somewhere. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Mark Hensley from the Pikes Peak Park Baptist Church in Colorado Springs, hoping you have a great rest of your afternoon. Bye, folks.